In this video, we will continue our series covering the 100k pound Triton main event in London. This time, we'll be analyzing a hand played between two of the top players in the world, Nikita Bajikowski and Viktor Malinowski, probably better known by his online handle, Limitless. Hey, got, got, in, got into the second most winningest player, right? Yeah, I'm on life tilt now. <laughs> we join the action with 24 players left, with 17 to be paid. Makita opens under the gun, holding ace-10 suited, with essentially a min-raise. At around this stack depth, we see that the solver will begin to limp a significant portion of its holdings. With the ante in play, Makita should have an incentive to see more flops compared to the non-ante game. But at the same time, if he RFIs and is 3-bet, he'll be forced to fold a significant portion of his range, thus depleting his short stack. The solver apparently addresses this dilemma by limping, since keeping the pot smaller will allow the limper to call raises with a greater portion of his range and see a flop. And to disguise its strategy, the limps are allocated across most of the range, including the strongest holdings. However, I'm not quite certain how many players in reality actually limp at this stack depth under the gun, so instead of using this 25 big blind range for our simulation, we will be assuming a 40 big blind range for Makita, which is similar in terms of combos which open, but without any limping. <laughs> well, he's laughing it off, but he was very proud of making that list, so... But if I win the entire prize pool of this tournament, then I pass him. Nicely. What if you win this tournament and then win another tournament or something? Then that would, yes, <laughs> that would, that would uh, effectively like work. That. If I, I think if I won every remaining Triton tournament, including this one, I might pass him, maybe. <laughs> Wouldn't be enough, I don't think. Oh yeah, if I had that, then I probably would. Actually, short deck gets a lot, right? Short deck will get oh, man. like four. We're gonna see bullets first. flying. Yeah. These people would <laughs> easy, you know? Right. Six, seven bullets. Limitless calls on the button with eights. Comparing the button's GTO strategies at 40 big blinds versus 25 big blinds, which is close to Limitless's 23 big blind stack, we see that overall, the classes of combos which defend are similar, but the method of defense is quite different. Not surprisingly, at 25 big blinds, the solver will start to introduce some shoves, particularly with ace-king off and some jacks and tens, and it also adds in a few suited aces and queen-jack suited combos as bluffs. Interestingly, the solver simply flats kings and aces with some frequency. Presumably this is due to the lower SPR, since these holdings should tend to want to keep alive the weaker portions of the villain's range with a goal of playing for stacks post-flop on many runouts. We see that the solver also raises with 8s here with some frequency, but given the proximity to the bubble, simply flatting against a stronger under the gun range is likely the best option when short stacked. Right. Six, seven bullets? Uh, I don't think I'll ever pass him. <laughs> People just laughing. I plan on playing yeah, less. He plans on yeah. playing, more, playing more. I, have, I guess... You've got to encourage more million buy-ins then. You've got to encourage more. Yeah, and just five million buy-ins. Oh. <laughs> million. Someone's got to up it now. <laughs> That's just... We don't have to go 5x, we can we can go 2x first. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you got to make it hurt for Brent. He'll have 90% of himself in that tournament. The next highest person will have like 0.0%. Right. Right. You've got to make sure he can't enter the next one. <laughs> we'll have a lot of crossbooks. <laughs> exactly. Not only will he have 90%, he'll have crossbooked the world yeah. as well. Not even just... Yeah, not even just last on the crossbook. <laughs> you, look, you gotta give that guy credit. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Five. The flop comes three, six, deuce, and Makita continues with a small bet of around a quarter pot. Here we see that the solver is checking ace-10 suited most of the time and is checking roughly two-thirds of its range overall. This is probably one of the worst possible boards for Makita, given that his range will be very top-heavy with a lot of whiffs, and Limitless's cold calling range on the button after an under-the-gun open should be quite narrow and concentrated around pocket pairs and suited connectors, giving him an edge in straights and sets. If we compare the GTO strategy on this flop versus 120 other flops which were selected to be representative of the entire game, we see that there are primarily three types of boards that the preflop razor should tend to want to check against in this scenario. 
One are boards with two or more low cards, such as the case in this hand for the reasons mentioned. Another are monotone boards, since the potential of made flushes tends to mitigate range advantage due to the high percentage of suited combos the caller should have. And the third category are ace-high boards, since a paired ace does not typically require as much protection, and the preflop caller should also have a number of aces in his range as well. That being said, as Makita's range is uncapped and at a slight equity advantage, we see that the EV difference between checking and betting one quarter pot is relatively small for the entire range, including ace-10 suited, so this play appears to be okay from a GTO perspective as long as it's used with relatively low frequency. So the action cut away here, but Limitless ended up simply calling behind. We see that the solver is primarily mixing its strategies with its overpairs here, other than aces which are mostly checking since they don't need as much protection and also block a number of Makita's bluffs. And overall, we see that the button is doing very little folding in this spot facing the small bet. If we compare this scenario to our 120 representative flops, we see that there appears to be an inverse correlation between the rank of the cards in the flop and the amount of defending the button is doing. The button is folding less often with boards that have lower cards and is folding with much higher frequency despite the small bet when the flop has higher cards. This makes sense given that besides made hands and draws, one of the primary candidates to float with in the face of a c-bet are holdings with two overs and a backdoor flush draw, as we can see here in the middle of this calling range. And over here too, big big spot with the stack size. Look at these guys' stack sizes. They yeah. both have very vulnerable stacks here. Not a lot of big blinds behind for each. You got to feel two eights is feeling pretty good in this spot. Wow. Nikita. The turn brings the two of diamonds pairing the board and Makita barrels with slightly larger than a half pot bet. Interestingly, we see that Pio increases its aggression compared to the flop and is betting over half of its range. This may seem counterintuitive given that the deuce should not connect with the undergun razor. So what is the reasoning for this shift? Well, when considering our actions at any given state in the game, we must keep in mind the prior actions which led up to this point for the purpose of narrowing and defining our opponent's range. Given that Limitless decided to simply call behind on the flop, the solver will remove combinations from its range that should have folded or raised. Since Limitless should have check raised a number of his sets and overpairs in the face of Makita's bet, we see that both Makita's equity and EV have increased dramatically. In particular, we see that Makita's advantage in percentage of overpairs is now nearly double. Coupling this with the fact that Limitless should have been calling relatively wide with low equity hands on the flop, Makita should be incentivized to continue to apply pressure with his uncapped range. That being said, of course there must be some limits to aggression and we see that Ace-10 of Hearts is actually one of the few hands that Pio prefers to predominantly check, likely because it has some showdown value and limited blocking and unblocking properties. Additionally, holding hearts in particular is not favorable since it blocks some of Limitless's backdoor floats on the flop. Thinking he's going to put pressure on a lot of sixes, maybe or threes that would defend. What do you? What do you oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's an under the gun raise, and then okay, and then a defend on the dealer button. So even more interesting of a spot. Sort of a, a really tough spot with the eights, Lex. I mean, you're either well, you're either good or you're not, right? That's that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And this is uh, this is another one, one of those spots where Bajakowski is just saying, you know, I raised under the gun, I was gonna fire at it. People don't really bluff these boards, but you know, that's exactly the reason uh, why I can get some faults, and it's a trend that we see in a lot of these hands. And you gotta put some respect on it. Like Bajakowski is not really gonna be messing about with this stack this close to the money, raising off a 20 big blind stack. But you know, he's capable. It's just a flat call. I mean, actually, as he. You know, he still has a six outs, one to come, 14% roughly. But the question is on a seven, on a, on a, yeah, yeah, I want to see a brick jack, on a yeah. queen. In limitless issues, we see that Pio prefers to raise pocket eights, although it is predominantly calling or folding with the remainder of its range. 
it does make sense to raise some of these weaker overpairs such as tens, nines, eights, and sevens to deny equity since they are very vulnerable to a number of Broadway bluffs that Makita may have barreled with. Additionally, it appears that Pew is more inclined to raise with these weaker overpairs due to the low SPR. If we rerun the sim and increase the SPR significantly, we see that although PO does raise with some eights, it's at a much lower frequency since generally you shouldn't want to play for larger pots with a weaker overpair against an uncapped range. Instead, in the higher SPR game, the solver allocates raises to some of the stronger overpairs that would prefer to increase the pot size going to the river given the deeper stacks. I want, I want to see a break, I want to see a nine. Yeah. I just want to, because, you know, it keeps it most marginal. It, it's easier to get folds when the river's a queen. I want to see what Bajikowski does on, like, a nine. or See, like, this is, if you're going to keep betting, then this, this card... This is actually a fantastic bluff card yeah, for, exactly. yeah, for him because yeah. he has ace king for bluffs. He's got he's got a lot of things now that it's just like if you're Malinowski, it's tough here. Yeah, it's also <coughs> what's nice too is for Bajikowski, not only does it do his bluffs get there because he hits the king, but he could also already have queens and jacks, and he just go be going all in the same way because right. uh, Malinowski is just not going to have. Uh, the king. King very often. Yeah, he can't really hold on with king queen on the turn, yeah. right? So it's like he doesn't really have ever other than like a trapped aces. Yeah, he and could have like king jack of clubs or something, but that's about that's about it as far as kings go. <laughs> and you're right; he could still uh, trap definitely from uh, from these stack sizes. And but the thing is, though, he, uh, Nikita does block aces with an ace, and I don't know on kings if you get that cute like on the turn, the stack mm -hmm. depths, you might just put it in. So, I mean. It's interesting stuff. This is this is not a brick, but it's also a interesting card, and he doesn't show so. up. With the king on the river, we see that the solver increases its aggression even further, since the king generally favors the under-the-gun razor's range, and also given Limitless's passive line to this point. As we can see, the solver is actually opting to shove here with around 80% of its range. The only hands that are checking with significant frequency in this spot are the stronger aces and lower pairs that potentially have some showdown value, as well as some of these Broadway combos that block some of Limitless's flush draw floats and are therefore given up. We see that these ace-10 suited combos that unblock clubs are mostly shoving here as well. That being said, we should keep in mind the context of the tournament where we are near the bubble with a minimum payout of around $233,000. Obviously, this is something which the solver does not take into account and should cause the players with shorter stacks to play a bit more conservatively, so generally, Makita choosing a more passive route is likely justified for this borderline hand. And this is going to be a very relieved Malinowski to, to check back here. I can't imagine we're gonna see a bet there. Yeah, I would, that would blow my mind. <laughs> this would be like the next level value bet. Oh my, value or even like, is he ever? He well, yeah, because he's not really trying to bluff queens no, or jacks. There's, there's so no it's point like... in bluffing here. <coughs> just, you're gonna be good so often that. He, did he? Did he bet? I think he put in a time bank. Okay. Wow. I mean, does he ever in a million years think like nine? he's gained like nines, tens, jacks to fold? Or Man, it, I'm just... sorry. If he gets called here, that this is like one of the plays of the tournament for me, honestly. It's, <laughs> um, I, I I, just I don't think he's trying to make nines and tens fold because he's just going to win too often against these hands. Yeah. This hand. So Limitless decides to shove here, which may seem counterintuitive, but we see that the solver is in agreement with this move and is actually shoving a majority of its range. So why is that? Well, again, at each decision point, it is imperative that we recall the action in prior streets to help define our opponent's range. And in this case, as mentioned previously, since the king is one of the most favorable river cards for the preflop raiser, Mikita should have been betting almost all of his value hands, especially since he double barreled up to that point. As a result, we see that by virtue of Mikita's check, the equities and EVs of the players have shifted dramatically, now overwhelmingly favoring Limitless. Yes, the solver will check some of its value combos on the river in Makita's shoes, such as a few jacks and king-jack combos, 
But as we know, the solver makes decisions based on the probabilities of the opponent having certain hands and not on the mere possibility of the opponent having certain hands. So in this spot, the solver decides to shove with 8s, 7s, and even ace-6 suited since these holdings should be ahead of a decent portion of, though not all of, Makita's remaining range. That being said, a few caveats should be noted here. First, as mentioned previously, the solver does not take into account the situational context of being close to the bubble, so it doesn't recognize that Makita may have played the river more passively than usual with a made hand such as 10s, 9s, or a weak king. It also doesn't recognize that Limitless should be playing more passively as well, and in particular, should be wary of risking his stack in a relatively marginal spot. Additionally, the solver's shoving range here is influenced by the very small SPR. If we compare the strategy here to the higher SPR sim, we see that the solver is doing around the same amount of betting, but it is utilizing the smaller sizing with much greater frequency. This is in contrast to the lower SPR game, which causes the solver to play made marginal hands more aggressively since the magnitude of risk is reduced. And Nikita might think he got somehow binked, like, yeah, a king somehow clubs or something, like a king of random king clubs. You know, or, or, I mean, you know what's super interesting is that if he's not going to expect Nikita to check any strong hand, right? Why would he? Any hand is better, think about it. Like, okay, maybe nines, nines, possibly tens, but anything better than that, from jacks all the way up to king x or better, would just go all in for value, because, you know, your opponent's going to check behind a lot. I mean, this, uh, I don't know, like, um, Victor Malinowski really showing why he belongs in this field here. That's incredible. I really hope he gets paid off. All right. Nikita finds a fold. Man, that's cool. Yeah, all, very interesting. Like we said, you know, nobody is the best in the world because they win aces versus queens at the last 15, but people are the best in the world because they pull moves like this. With only ace high, Makita decides to fold, which we see is consistent with the solver strategy. The solver will call with virtually any made hand, so in theory, there are a number of weaker hands than pocket eights that should have called, which justifies Limitless's bet. However, only a few of the stronger ace-high combos are being called as bluff catchers, excluding ace-10 suited. So I thought this hand was quite informative since it really highlights just how important thinking in ranges is from a GTO perspective. And not just in terms of our own range, but also in terms of the range of our opponent and how it is defined by his actions on each street, as well as how our opponent may perceive our range by virtue of our actions. Accordingly, before considering the strategies for a specific hand, to implement GTO strategy correctly, it is critical to first assess our entire range and how it stacks up against our opponent's range and how both interact with the board, since this significantly influences how the solver plays individual holdings. So that's the video for today. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay balanced.